Beep, 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 beep. How are we, good peeps? Welcome to the court of the EDI Jester. Good afternoon, good evening, all that stuff. Um, how are we all? I want to say that things are in the, up in the air and a, a bit of a uh, kerfuffle at the moment is probably the understatement of the century. Um, all sorts going on. Lots happening. Lots of things occurring. People disagreeing. People um, uh, finding new spaces, finding new areas in which to collaborate and work towards common goals. Um, it's not unusual to see, uh, I think, the, this kind of activity. Um, and uh, I've just had the most incredible week with some of the warrior teachers. Um, I've got the rest of them coming up in the next couple of days. It's always a pleasure every month to get together and to speak with them and to talk to them and to listen to what they have to say about what's going on and the work that they are doing and, and how they're trying to understand and make their pathway through this the terrible, um, alarming and discombobulating times in which we find ourselves. So it always centres me when I get to do that. You know, and it's other people that centre us in it. When you talk to them and you have conversations and you gain a different perspective and you look outside and you see what it is that's going on. Um, I think as we move forward and things begin to take shape, we can expect to see these kinds of what I call storming sessions. Now, you can, you know, moan and scream about X, Y, Z and whoever's who and who's doing what and who's doing whom to who. And we, we do. And we hold each other to account. And we do so sometimes vociferously. And we do that because that's how the game, how the game is played, is that we do. I, I say something and somebody will get on to me and go, what, are you nuts? Right. Or somebody else will say something and I'll go, old fire, right, old fire. I'm not comfortable with that. Or have we considered or will we bring it on? There's a theory from years ago. Uh, I talk about this in my first Warrior Teacher session called Storming, Forming, Norming and Performing. And many of you that have ever had to sit through extra leadership training programs will know about it. Yeah, the reason it exists is because it makes a lot of sense. It's been messed about with since Bruce Tuckman, I think his name was, brought it into into into, into sort of stark realisation. It was picked up by the corporate training centres, and it, but it applies equally to us. As groups form and disappear and, you know, forming, then you're storming, then you're, you know, storming, sorry, then forming, then norming, then performing. You know, so it's about groups will change and alter and things will happen that mean we coalesce in different ways and we do other things. It doesn't change the end goal. It doesn't change the end goal, okay? And I, would, I after all these years, and I've understood this for a very long time, having worked with teams for a very long time, in my career, um, it never doesn't hurt. It always feels uncomfortable, it always feels difficult, it always feels hard. Um, but having said that, there are certain things that we as people, I think, need to get our head around and certain things that we have to be unwavering on. And one of those things you're, you're already aware is uh, safeguarding, which is a challenge for all of us as people. Safeguarding is a very uh, a simple idea. Everybody comes under the umbrella, it's that simple. Nobody gets to go beyond safeguarding because when people go beyond safeguarding, we see what happens. So safeguarding is a foundational principle of all that we do in our attempts to help children um, and young people who are growing up now navigate through the insane times that have been brought upon us by academia and make no bones about it, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly where this came from. I think it's really important to recognise as well that safeguarding is a lens that we should use um, at all times. But in addition... We have to be careful that we don't uh, over safeguard. So it's a, it's a it's a fine line. We safeguarding is always a thing, but you can not that we ignore safeguarding, but that it can intrude into places where it shouldn't. And I think that's caused problems in itself. In when we start to safeguard adults who have no reason to be safeguarded, um, my favourite bugbear with some of my uh, friends and some of my followers is the 18 to 25 myth about people, which is, I'm sick of hearing it. We don't wait for people to get to 18 and for their legs to fully form so they can walk. Um, it's something we don't need. It's an unnecessary part of this. It's immaterial, but somebody is 18 years old, they are an adult unless they are classed as clinically vulnerable or clinically disabled or whatever it may be that is their particular need that we have to help um, make sure they get so that they can compete and have the quality of opportunity throughout our society. So these are all the things that come from what got us to where we were before this all began to fall apart in about 2014. So there are, as I said, a few things that I think we need to clear up and, and be absolutely clear about. Men can never be women. 
You never pander to men who think they are women. There's two of them. Want to start there? Never pander to men who think they can be women. Never. Okay? And you never allow men who think they can be women to set the agenda because they are deluded from the beginning. From the beginning. Another one for you. There is no such thing as an AGP child. There is no such thing as an AGP child. Children are not fetishists and they are not paraphiliacs. They are adult concerns. Adult concerns. Okay. Now it may be that your average 16, 17 year old boy is going to walk quite like a bit of that, but, the, but it's not a formed thing. Right? Not find 18, there aren't many 18 year olds strung up in the clubs, are there? You know? In the, in the in the gay bondage clubs or the straight bondage clubs or throwing their throwing their keys in the in, in the fruit bowl in the nineteen seventies. Fetishism is an adult thing. Paraphilia is a dangerous thing. The difference between a fetish and a paraphilia is oh I'll well, have a bit of that on a Friday every now and again you know a paraphilia is how do I make my paraphilia manifest is the first thing you think when you wake up in the morning. It is an obsessive behaviour. Over the last 25 years since I've been in, involved in being an out and proud homo, 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 homo sexual, <laughs> in which I've gone from being a rather handsome 37 year old, slim, sexy little man, to a round roly poly 60 year old pervert, <laughs> that I have come across men of all kinds. And I can assure you that I've come across men who have the particular paraphilia that is on the table at the moment, which is autogynephilia. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that those men and the cross-dressers who are, if you will, their distant cousin, all have the same thing in mind. Sex. AGP is about sex, okay? It's about sex. There are no AGP children. The retro-conning of men with paraphilia and fetishes of their own history is not rare. I've met hundreds of them. I'm not kidding. Because of where I was situated culturally. Hundreds of them. There are no AGP children. We do not allow that particular myth to cement. And there are no special AGP men. There are no men who have the belief system that they are a woman and indulge in that fantasy, fetish or paraphilia, who are in any way an expert on anything. Anything. Whatsoever. It's that simple. Because they are lying about who they are. They are lying to themselves. They are playing out a fantasy. Now, likewise, it's the same for the women. I put up a video the other day about fat, hairy women who think they're gay men and bears. These women need to bugger off, right? And it, it's the reasons behind why they're doing it, I don't care. You and I know they're different. We know that, right? What I'm saying to you right now is that they're, as far as I'm concerned, just as bad. Anybody who is unable to accept the one thing that is absolutely certain about us from the moment conception occurs to the day that we slough our, off our mortal coil with a final fart, is that we are male or female. That's it. Anybody who doesn't accept that simple fact cannot and should not be involved in any provision of education or of therapeutic help for any child. End of story. That's my line. Now, that will be somebody else, that won't be somebody else's line and we're going to have the conversation about that. People will bring out stuff and go, right, here's what we're going to do, right? Here's what we're going to do. Here's a statement of what we're going to do. And I'll get it and I'll go, okay, okay, okay. Mm, nope, we're going to have words about that. Okay, okay. Nope. That's what we do. That's what we do. Right? Because they put it out and it's open to everybody to look at. Whatever it may be, whoever it may have come from. And we as individuals can then go, oh, and we as groups can go, oh. So I've just said, for example, to my group of warrior teachers, I need a couple of people that are willing to look into, I say my warrior teachers, they're not, they're, not, they're just warrior teachers now, they're often gone. Um, I need two people, a team of four, two, two, two people working each 
in, in, in a team, uh, separately looking at Advance HE and looking at uh, Pride in STEM, who I think are two organisations of great concern after some of the stuff that I've seen online in the last couple of days. Great concern. And so they'll, they'll, they'll volunteer and go, right, I'll have a look, we'll see what we can find, right? And we'll, we'll try and bring these devils down. Now, likewise, the same goes for us. You'll release something, I'll get it and have a look. Other people, all different organisations, other individuals will all get it and have a look and there'll be a chance for us to discuss what it is that you put out. But there is nothing that you are going to put out that you're going to get away with calling a fait accompli. It simply isn't going to happen. Specifically, and I will clearly state this so everybody understands where I am coming from, specifically, if you intend to entrench the concept of an AGP trans or gender dysphoric child. It simply doesn't exist. There are only children in distress. That's it. Right. People were asking me where, what my position was on all sorts of things over the last few days, and I've been having a mull about it. And this is where my mull got me. And I'm very sorry if there's if those of you that don't like that, but it's quite simple. Men in dresses and women, men pretending to be women and women pretending to be men, should not be near any provision of education, therapeutic, medical, um, uh, or any other area of importance to young people and children. For they are unable to live, live, live in reality from the moment they awake. They should not be there. It is a problem that has to have that strong solution. There is no place for the concept of the AGP child. There is no place for the concept that children have perversions and fetishes. There is no concept for the... It's just so sick, right? It's sick. It presupposes that that childish understanding of sex, which is taken from, you know, 13 to, should we say, 18, 19, 20, 21. You know, once you get into early 20s, you're like, oh, bang me on the bottom with the Woman's Weekly. Before that, that should, no, right? So 13 years old, you start discovering a bit of, you know, as your father with a mate or uh, that little exploration that we do when we're younger. Get to 16, you might meet somebody and you'll be with them for a little bit longer. You explore a bit further. That'll take you up until you're 18. After that, then you're, you're out and going, go, I really enjoy this. I'm loving this. And then you'll get introduced to the other stuff. The provision, the idea of the AGP fetishist or paraphilic child is an 18 plus concept that is designed to erode the boundaries of safeguarding and child protection. This is its only reason for existing. And from a safeguarding perspective, it is a no. And I don't care who in our organisations, who in our movement and who we work with and wouldn't work with and don't like and do like, if we can agree on that fundamental, fundamental statement that the provision of fetish and paraphilia is an adult 18 plus activity to which children should not be exposed. And which, as they, as they grow up, they will gradually find and go, well, no thanks, or, or yes, please, I'll have a bit. The cure for so-called gender dysphoria is puberty. The majority of people that are caught up in this are confused lesbian and gay young people or confused children right that's it that's the people that are caught up in it the cure for most of it is puberty we cannot and i personally will not allow the provision of a fetishistic or paraphilic child to enter into any part of any process that a child who is confused is taking through be that therapeutic or educational they're teaching this crap in schools and we can't, we can't be part of that. We can't. Anyway. Come and join the warrior teachers. Come and join the warrior teachers. I'll see you later.